Royal Tea has become a normal site in Philippine Basketball Association, and through the years, we've seen players who made their mark. There's Philip Cesar, once known as Prince Philip, who became the king of the hard court and papal king. We have His Excellency El Presidente Ramon Fernandez, who wound up with four most valuable player awards and a league hall of famer, and there's a sultan as well, Bernie Fabiosa, the sultan of swipe. They are just some of the few who became the so-called His Highness in the PBA. And then, of course, there's the prince of the Gene Kings, Vince Nison, who will be joining us to share his basketball journey. Good evening, Vince, and welcome to episode 8 of season 2 of The Link Podcast. Hello, Vince. Hello, hello, Ray. It's good to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me here to be on your show. It's, uh, it's a big honor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Vince, uh, would you like to greet uh, probably the Ginebra fans out there? They're, they're watching right now, as well as your old fans as well. Thank you so much for your support and love throughout the years. It's been a, a very good ride for me. Um, I'm still reaping the benefits of, uh, you know, an amazing career that I, I never expected. And, uh, you know, it's just grace, just absolute grace from God. I appreciate um, all of the good things. I have so many wonderful memories. And, uh, you know, first and foremost, you know, it would have never happened if it weren't for, you know, so many great coaches I had along the way uh, and great teammates, uh, especially my my coach in Hanover, Coach Jaworski, and all my wonderful teammates, uh, you know, of course, Bal, Marlu, Noli, and uh, Dodot, and everybody else. There's so many uh, to name, but I just want to say, you know, you guys uh, much appreciated, and uh, I look back with such fond memories. Okay. Vince, uh, I know uh, you played college ball in uh, the U.S., then you transferred here. No, When you transferred and played college ball in Ateneo, Yes. Well, what were the things you noticed about Filipino brand of play? Well, I, I looked at it like this, you know, um, States is, you know, they're such tall guys, you know, they got seven footers and uh, six, 10 guys and they're like normal. I mean, it's just like mm -hmm. everybody's big and um, it's very vertical. Uh, it's very, everybody tries to jump as high as you can. And um, when I got to the Philippines, I, I said to myself, it's different in the sense it's a little more horizontal. Because the, okay. you know, top to bottom, guys are very fast. We have very okay. fast guards, obviously, but we also have pretty fast, you know, forwards and centers who can really run the floor. So, um, you know, even the center can bring up the ball a lot of times, and they're, and they're very fast. So it's a little more horizontal, um, and I will say rugged. Um, you know, uh, guys aren't afraid to make contact and to <laughs> rough it up a little bit. So that's the difference, I guess you could say, for me. And, and you've experienced that right away, that physicality. You know, the very first time I, I got to go to a Hanebra practice, sorry, I'm starting my watch party. Um, uh, I was in Hanebra, I'm sorry, I was in Ateneo, and uh, mm -hmm. Dada, who was my teammate, asked mm -hmm. me if I wanted to go join one of the practices that, they, that we had. So I, I said, sure, no problem. And they, I, yes, it was an ultra. I'll never forget, it was 1991, 92. And... I when I went to the practice, you know, I was this Phil M, whatever, whatever, right? And I'll never forget with the, you know, they practiced. We were just kind of shooting on the side. And at the end, they said, hey, you want to join us for the scrimmage? I said, sure. And so Dodo and I joined. I'll never forget. I got the ball on the left side. I had, uh, I think it was Maki De Hoya guarding me. I shook him to the, to the left and I went down the middle and uh, here comes Sonny Kabatu on this side, and here comes <laughs> Loizaga on this side, and I was uh, sandwiched there. <laughs> After I got off the ground, I was like, wow. <laughs> that was great. Okay. But, you know, again, it, it was not intentional to, like, hurt or maybe. It's just really rough and rugged, and mm -hmm. I didn't really love it. At first, I was like, you know, I mean, at first, I'm like, you know, I learned that's how it is. And everybody, if you're not going to be physical and learn how to play with physical contact, you're going to have a hard time. Uh -huh. Okay. Was, was your college coach Chuck Reyes? Was um, your college coach? At first, when I got there, he was the coach. And um, I had to take my uh, residency. And mm -hmm. when I took my residency, that's when he took the job uh, at Purefoods. So okay. 
um, while I was going to be his player in two places, actually. I was kind of following him. Um, mm. I was drafted by him at the uh, Burger Machine in the PBL. So uh -huh. I played for him in the PBL and then, you know, for him in Ateneo, but he left. So I ended up, it was kind of a surprise when he actually drafted me in 94 uh, because I thought that he just didn't want to be around me. <laughs> no, just kidding. But um, <laughs> the coach was, uh, during my UAP time, was uh, Coach Baby, the Lupan. Okay. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you had a brief stint playing in the PBL as well, uh, sort of polishing your game a bit more before plunging to the pros. Uh, what team did you play for, uh, aside from Burger, uh, Burger Machine, right? I only played for Burger Machine, and I only played actually one conference. And we <laughs> won the con we won the championship. Uh, we had a very strong lineup. Uh, our coach was uh, Coach Perry Ronquillo. Mm -hmm. uh, before coach obviously went to the pro league and played in, in coach shell but uh -huh. um you know we had a I, I will say we had a really good team if you think about the the names that were on that team we had you know wilmer Ong, uh okay. El Nicolo, richie tixon uh kenneth Derendes, uh i can go down matt Macalintal. i mean all of these guys played um long david i mean they all played in the pba right uh, uh, you know ronica handing Boise Samar, I mean, uh, uh, this is a lot. Uh, Billy Ray, I mean, it was so fun. And it was uh, um, uh, Mike Mustre. Again, so many good players, and they all played guard. And so I was the guard too. So it was tough to get playing time. I was the rookie, and I'm playing behind, you know, Kenneth Rendes and stuff like that. He was already a, a many-year veteran in, in PBL at that time. And he, he, he was the top gun during that time, Kenneth Duremdes. Yeah, he was the MVP of the PBL. Right. And then there was a time Kenneth Duremdes in the UAP is averaging close to 40 points. Uh, that, uh, that's how uh, proficient Kenneth, Kenneth Duremdes, that Duremdes was. And it was, that's for sure, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, in the PBA, your first team was Pure Foods. Pure Foods is a distinction of being a glamour team through the years. But were you determined to prove to all in San Brian that you're more than just a pretty face and let your game do the talking? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm, I could care less about how I look. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm the kind of guy that just plays hard. I don't care what happens. Let's just go hard. Let's do what we can as, as well as we can. And then, you know, after that, let the pieces fall wherever they may. Because I've always been you know, the kind of person that says, if, if you don't give your all, don't expect the best. But uh -huh. if you do your all and the best doesn't come, at least you can say you tried your best. Right. right. That's right. kind of my, been my attitude. So when I work out, when I go to practices and games, I always go hard. I go hard even before the practice starts. I'm, I'm usually early. You can ask any of those guys. Um, I made it, um, you know, there was, there was an award I got in high school that mm -hmm. I would say is a um, sort of dig. But for me, I, I loved it. It was called the uh, Jim Rat Award. Because okay. I got the Jim Rat Award when I was a freshman in high school. Because if uh -huh. I wasn't in class, I was in the gym. If uh -huh. I was studying, I was in the gym. You wouldn't find me running around doing other things. Uh, you know, I was the rat. I would be there as, until, like, even they'd kick me out practically. Uh, <laughs> because that's, that was the passion I had. I, I wanted to get better and uh, really be the best that I could be. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there at Pure Foods, you had the opportunity of playing alongside one of the best Philippine basketballers ever produced, Alvin Patrimonio, and one of the best pen tacticians in Chot Reyes, and you became a part of the champion squad. But how did you feel when you got traded by the end of the season of 1994? Well, uh, first of all, you, you can't say Alvin without saying Jerry. You know, it's just okay, of course, of course. They're 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 the one two punch. I mean, mm -hmm. Michael and Pippin. I mean, it's, there's there's not <laughs> Jerry wouldn't have been Jerry without Alvin, and Alvin wouldn't have been Alvin without Jerry because they really spread the, spread the court well. Um, uh -huh. it, it was a great experience for me, you know. Especially, I gotta say, Alvin is just like what I call a pro's pro. I mean, mm -hmm. all professionals even say, "Wow, Alvin!" Especially at that time when. He would throw like 1,000 moves at you every single, you know, time down the court. And, and he could do so much for the guy who was, what, 6'3", 
Uh, mm. was doing all of these inside operations. And he, he was a real, um, uh, you know, impetus for me because guys like that, you know, if you want to say pretty boy, you know, why don't he's it? I mean, he's the good looking MVP guy who does everything <laughs> and he has all the commercial deals and, you know, all of those things. So, I mean, but he was just so humble and mm -hmm. nice. And I remember the first time I got there, he actually took all the rookies and he said, guys, let's go out. We'll have lunch. So he brought us all, you know, it wasn't like Shangri-La, like you would think. I mean, I think it was Goldilocks. Or something. Anyways, uh, he took us some, uh, someplace to eat and we just talked and we bonded and that's how he was. So he was a really good guy. Coach Shot was very fiery, as you uh, as we all know, he can be. Uh, I think he's come down or come down a bit in his uh, more recent years, but uh, you know, definitely a, another big influence because he really pushes you. Um, he's not afraid of anybody or any situation. He likes to have like that. I will say the healthy friction going, which is which is okay. Most teams have that; they'll have that, and we have that as well. I mean, in Fearful. Now getting traded, I, you know, it's one of those things as a player, it happens. You know, you can't, your fate isn't in your hands, especially in the PBA because, you know, <laughs> how it is when you have the rights to a player, it has to be traded. You can't like say, I'm an unrestricted free agent. I can go wherever I want. That's, that wasn't the case back then. I don't know if it's changed now. So, um, you know, when I was traded, I was like, okay, that's good. Maybe it's a good chance for me to have a fresh start because it was also difficult uh, for me in Pure Foods because it's such a inside oriented team. You know, okay. it, the first thing is get the ball to Alvin. The second thing is get the ball to Jerry. And the third thing is there is no third thing. <laughs> so <laughs> the shooter, it was a little difficult, um, you know, because to shine as far as, you know, but, you know, I, get, I hold nothing against them. That's the, that's the way it was. They were the veterans. The team was winning championships. Who am I to say anything? So, um, when I was traded, you know, it was, it was a little, it was very happy, of course, because um, number one, I've always respected coach Jaworski, you know, he's really, you know, he took me under his wing, even before I got to the PBA, um, mm -hmm. you know, cause Donald and me were very close. So, you know, I actually lived in the same subdivision. So, you know, we would see each other quite a bit and he would always help me and always encourage me, even if I wasn't playing for him. So when I got to be his player, it was a different type of encouragement. And I really, I think, responded well to it. So, um, you know, it, it, in some senses, you know, sad because I had some very good friends in the Pure Foods team and good, good, good guys all around. Um, there's nobody I really don't like. Um, but, you know, he never was a different level. I mean, for me, that was like, I will say it's sort of a homecoming because that's really the first place I practiced in the first place. You know? So I was sort of used to the rugged and I was like, let's go. If this is the way it's going to be. Let's do it. Okay, okay. Well, it, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise, though, as you were traded to the league's most popular team, which was on search of the next big star, and you got that opportunity to shine. Can you still recall your career-defining moment at Ginebra? Career-defining? Wow. Uh, you know, um, my, my first year there, uh, people talk about how we went up. You okay. Know, when... Uh, but really, you know, the first year was a struggle. I'll have to say that 95 was, was tough because, you know, we had so many things happening. Um, uh, Noli was playing really well. And, and I was, just, um, I think 96, 97, obviously, is where we started to go up. Right. That's right. The mm -hmm. puzzle. But as far as career defining moment, I mean, there's so many for me. Um, I mean, where I, I could name 20 things that, Helped me with my confidence, uh, mm -hmm. including other players starting to talk trash to me or attempt to talk trash <laughs> to me, or even other coaches trying to say things to me, which is <laughs> that made me, that actually gave me confidence. I'm like, okay, now before they don't care who I am because I'm just some guy who probably is the fourth stringer in pure food, whatever. They don't want, they don't bother. But now that I'm starting to play well and score points and make some plays happen, now I'm somebody who's a threat. So now they want to say mm -hmm. something. So it actually helped me. I mean, raise my confidence. Um, but it's you know the biggest career define I, I have to say would be probably the block on Dindo. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I recall that '97 old Filipino. That was a big one for me. Probably my uh, first quarter in uh, the '97 finals, Commissioner's Cup. 
Um, I went that that was the that first half actually it was probably my best half in uh, in pure in sorry in Hinebra in in the finals because I really felt I could make everything and it, it was that kind of confidence that was like wow this is this is how it is and it's like they call it the zone. Um, it, it really, it's an interesting thing being in the zone because everything is slow motion except you. It's like, they're all like bionic, like something like one of those matrix things, but you're just kind of like going by them. So, um, it really felt good. Um, and it just so happened that it was in the very important game. So I was very happy with that. And again, there's so many, I could, I mean, um, there's a lot of interesting times that we had as players, especially. Um, you know, um, when we talk about, you know, guys on the team that were more than just teammates, you know, mm-hmm. they really are. I mean, they're, 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 they're family that we talk to each other now. It's like, it's like, it was yesterday that we were together and you look back and we got to like nineties. Wow. It's been almost, it's more than 20 years. So it's been a while. Right. But, right. You know, happy to be a part of that great situation. And of course, coach Jaworski was the one who, was the, you know like the father like the tata in the group and he was the one leading us and up to now you know when we see coach he, he is just like the most inviting and, and and very very humble and he's the one who really is trying to you know get into our lives understand what you know how we are how is our families uh you know more important than the basketball it's it's really about life so that's for me the definition of a, an amazing coach mm-hmm. Of course, Hinebra is mentioned in the same breath with the game's biggest star, Robert Jaworski. You oh. played for his team at the time when he was already 49. But mm-hmm. other than that, what were the great things you've seen that impressed you the most? <laughs> you know, work ethic is one. You know, okay. Jaworski is, you know, I don't care if he was 49. Right now, I'm, I'm 49. <laughs> I'm going to be 49. <laughs> and I'm okay. thinking to myself, you know, some days I wake up and something hurts, like from okay. a leg or whatever, right? And I'm like, why does this leg hurt? I didn't do anything yesterday. Maybe it was getting old. I don't know. But Coach Jaworski was there every day and he was working so hard. And, you know, he was not one to keep everything, you know, to himself. He would tell us, say, guys, you're not working hard enough. Guys, you need to do more. You need to show up earlier. You need to get more shots or you need to work on your moves or weights or whatever. He would tell us all those things and he was open and honest to us. So he gained our trust because we know he had our best intention. And me personally, because you know we're basically sort of the same position, I had the pleasure of guarding him every day. And I really found out the rugged Robert Jaworski on a, on a daily basis. And he, he taught me uh, a lot of stuff. I will say that um, it was painful at first, but uh, mm-hmm. once I learned it, I was like, well, it's killing, it works. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Vince at Ginebra, we know that you were treated like rock stars, but can you tell us how do you usually spend your day playing for the league's most popular team in between being mobbed by fans and getting along with them? Uh, well, you know, my, my career, I mean, outside of Hinebra started to get a little crazy because I started <laughs> to get some, you know, commercial endorsements. <laughs> I started a TV show. I had a sports show in ABS-CBN. I, there was so many things that were happening. So I, I was pretty busy outside of that. I mean, um, I, I wasn't married at the time, so I guess that was a, a, an advantage in a sense because I had a few extra hours in the day. But, um, you know, it was it was still a, a, a thing that coach would always, even if you're busy outside, he'd always bring us back to say, guys, weights, you got to do your weights. Guys, go to the track. You got to run. You got to get stronger in the running or whatever. So, you know, when I do have my days off, usually those are the days I, you know, this is uh, – pre-social media and all this stuff so either you're, <laughs> right. you're calling somebody which or or you're or you're um, using your beeper, <laughs> so, beeper. right right <laughs> you know how it was back in those times but um you know we just spend a lot of time you know at home relaxing cooking uh sleeping um you know reading books and stuff like that so those are the types of things that we did to you know really you know unwind because you know 
it can get a little bit uh, taxing and you need your rest. If you're not resting, as a, as a, especially as a PBA player, you need to. And guys who don't, you know, have that discipline, like the ones who go out all the time and they're in the bars and all these things at night, uh, their careers get cut short very quick. So um, we, Coach Jaworski always reminded us, you know, be careful. We're not saying, you know, don't do certain things, but just don't do it too much. Just relax and, you know, make sure you focus number one on, on the sport. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, there was this dry spell from Ginebra since they won the 1991 Open Conference in a dramatic fashion. And the team had to wait to pick up the right pieces. But by 1996, it looks like the team was making some progress. Can you tell us something about the 1996 season? Yeah, well, when we when we got Marlu and, and Bal, basically, th- those two guys were just unbelievable. Um, you know, they were our like, the, the sort of Mutt and Jeff, I guess you could say, the, <laughs> the speedster. Uh, I look at, 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 you know, Bal, you know, I thought I was pretty fast at the time. Uh-huh. I thought I was one quick. And I'll never forget when there was a loose ball in one of our practices in um, Green Meadows. And uh, I went for it as fast as I could, but Val just went right by me <laughs> to, to go good. <laughs> wow, this guy's yeah. pretty good. So um, it was good. It was um, definitely, uh, we're, we're very good friends and uh, up to now. And uh, we had a good camaraderie on the court on and off. And we supported each other. I would hit him when he was open and, and vice versa. Um, when Marlo came in, I mean, obviously, that was the, the Twin Towers already. With EJ and, and Marlo, no right. one could uh, really uh, say anything because six, nine, seven foot in the PBA <laughs> that was tremendous. So we had to sort of uh, mold our game, change our game a bit uh, to uh, play to our strengths because no one can teach six foot nine. No one can teach seven feet. You can teach a lot of things, but you can't teach that. So uh, me personally, that's where I learned how to shoot um, farther. Um, I learned, uh, I call it thinking disruptively and acting disruptively. Because in, in, in my position, I was you know, a shooting guard at the time. <laughs> Most of the points I was getting was either off a three-point or a drive. Right? And then when the two big guys were there, the seven-foot and the six-nine guy, it's hard to drive because the end, all the defense is clogged. So I learned how to shoot not just three pointers, but um, I take a step back. And from there, I realized that most defenses have it in their brains. I don't know why it is, but it's like in their DNA. You only have to play defense up to the three point line. After that, they line out. Because back then, nobody's really going far. So then I said, okay, let's take a step back. So I started practicing it. And actually, I got confidence. And I said, hey, if I take one step back, what happens if I take two steps back? And then three. And I got to at least five. By the time I really was at my peak, I was at five steps behind the line. And then, uh-huh. then I said to myself, okay. And then when I started to make it, oh, my goodness, that's when the defense is, uh, yeah. you have to guard him now. So mm-hmm. even if I was two, three, four steps behind the line, you better be on me. And that, what that did was it opened up so much more space to, to dump it down to Marlu mm-hmm. and to, to Bao and, and, and EJ and Noli, who's always so active inside as well. So – it really became a weapon. And then when the defense would overextend, that's when I get to my drives. Uh, so that's how it really sort of uh, changed for me personally and, and for the team. Yeah. So, so before Jimmy Alapad, there was Vince Hison. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy's a beast. That's a beast. Too. I really respect Jimmy's game. Uh, I love how he plays. Uh, you know, I kind of wish we could have played together somehow, some way, but uh, he's, he's one guy that, um, you know, again, mighty mouse, he's, he's mm-hmm. ever judge a book by its cover. You know, you gotta say him and, and Bal are living proof of that. Bal looks like a skinny little kid. You look at it. Oh my God. What, is, what can he do? Mm-hmm. Well, he kills teams and he makes people cry. Right. Hey. And, uh, Jimmy, big shot after big shot. Yeah. Jimmy almost shocked the world with uh, a lot of his, uh, you know, career highlights as well, especially with the Gilas team. So two guys I very much respect. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. The year 1996 was definitely the year of Alaska, which won the Grand Slam that season. But during the 1996 season-ending conference, you were able to battle the Milkman in the championship series 
At that time, did you realize the team is really ready to hit the big time? Um, I remember that very well. It was a time, it was, uh, we were getting better. The, the mm -hmm. team was improving. Uh, we could see that, you know, I, I look at, I, I look at basketball teams a lot like, like waves in the ocean. Mm -hmm. If you can get with a team as the wave is going up, that's a good thing. But if you get with a team that's going down, that's, that's a hard, that's difficult, right? I'm so fortunate and happy. I, I was right on the building part of that wave when I got to Hinebra in, in 95. So I could see the progression from 95 to, to the end of 96. It was really uh, uh, interesting and fun ride. A lot of work, I'll tell you that. A lot of work uh, from morning until night. But um, we somehow we made it happen. And everybody contributed. And, you know, that's the thing about Hinebra. It doesn't matter who coach takes off the bench. He, he, mm -hmm. he has them ready. And he has this ability to make everybody believe in themselves. And sometimes they believe too much, but <laughs> really good about that. And like, you know, you have guys who, you know, some players that, you know, that he had just had unbelievable uh, experiences, made wins happen for their teams, made huge plays for their team. So coach, uh, coach had that definitely uh, with those players. So, you know, when I could see like towards the end of 96, everybody's starting to gel, gel, they call it gelling. Everybody's coming together, really playing well together. We understood each other. Like, for example, they knew when I was open and when I wanted the ball and when I didn't want the ball. And I knew when they wanted the ball and didn't want the ball. So, you know, that's what a good uh, team does. You give uh, each player um, the ball when they need it. Or uh, when they want it, so they can be successful as well. Because if they're successful, you're successful. Everybody's successful. Mm -hmm. Okay, and true enough. Uh, after that uh, final stint, uh, over the next two conferences, your team was able to make its way back to the championship round. You lost your points in the All Filipino of 1997, but have a fitting payback against Alaska in the 97 Commissioners Cup. Can you take us back to this wonderful journey of your 1997? Yeah, uh, well, I'll just talk about the championship. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I like talking about most anyways. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> first of all, I got to say that championship is still on the map in a lot of people's uh, brains and, and radars because, you know, up to now, I, you know, when we have these uh, Legends games where we play, you know, not just out, in, out of the, you know, Manila, but I'm talking out of the country and all these places, so many overseas foreign workers that, that enjoy, you know, bringing us over. A lot of them are like, yeah, I remember what I was doing, what I was wearing, what I was eating when you guys won the championship in 1997. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge deal for a lot of people, including us. Mm -hmm. um, now, as, as far as that, that series goes, you know, for me, um, that was a time where we said, okay, this is, if we're going to do it, this is our time. Uh, we had, I think, the right setup. We had a very good imports. You know, of course, Chris King was right there for us. Right. Um, you know, and and he's, he's a pro's pro. Mm -hmm. and I have all the respect for him as well. And we still message each other every once in a while. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he really played to all of our strengths as well because mm -hmm. he could do so many different things. He wasn't just a slasher. He wasn't just an inside guy. He could do it all. He could shoot. He could pass the ball, get it to you in the right position. He really understood, you know, you know he's, a, he's an NBA vet. He knew how to make guys better around him, and that's uh, – that's uh, what was really good. And then we had everybody firing on all cylinders, you know. I mean, that was, for me, the most, I guess you could say, athletic I was mm -hmm. ever going to be. <laughs> After that, it was kind of downhill. But, um, you know, my confidence was high. Val was hitting great shots and, and really leading the team um, in, in that respect as well. Uh, Pidal was shooting amazing. Right. Jay also was shooting amazing. You know, everybody contributed. Wilmer Ong had some amazing games. Benny Chang, you know, he didn't go on. I mean, even uh, Sina Dodot and, and uh, Teroy Alborillo. And Benny Chang. They all gave their their input. Aside, you know, for the, from the obvious, you know, the Marlos and the Nolis and the EJs. So um, it, it was just a great time. And, uh, you know, to beat Alaska after not beating them for so long. Right. <laughs> You know, I just have to admit that. And, uh, you know, I still give it to my friends, you know, um, you know, Sina Joe Lass and we're friends now. Okay. No, no, no uh, ill feelings or whatever. So it's funny because um, 
You know, I see Johnny all the time. I see Jeff Carriasso and Hodge and all these guys um, in uh, uh, Bong Hawkins. I, I see them, Rodney, all these guys. I see them around. They're always laughing. You know, like, you know, what? it's kind of funny. You know, everybody thinks about your, you know, championship, but they, they forget uh, we won a Grand Slam, right? <laughs> so I, I say things back. I'm like, yeah, you won the Grand Slam. Great. But People still remember our championship against you guys. So it's been, <laughs> a lot of good times. You know, we, we just, we rib each other a lot. Okay. Well, the creation of the Metropolitan Basketball Association posed a big threat to the PBA, especially during the early three seasons of the league. In 1998, did it enter your mind to cross over and play in the NBA? I, I had no, I had no plans. None, none whatsoever. Um, in fact, um, uh, I thought that I would end my career in it, to be honest with you. Um, I had every intention to. But again, um, as fate would have it, I, I, there's really no other way to describe it. So many things were happening, you know, that were way beyond my control. Like, for example, you know, the ownership of the team from right. Polancas to the Coancos. And that was, a, that was a big difference, right, in the, in the structure, in the way it was being run. And then, you know, just things were starting to change. You could, you could sort of feel it. And then Coach Jaworski resigns. Right. <laughs> and, you know, and Doda also says, I'm done as well. So I'm like, wow, this is supposed to be our family. And there goes our dad. <laughs> My brother, he's gone too. I'm like, this is different. This is different. And then other guys started to hear wind that uh, they are also getting offers to play in other leagues. So, you know, um, Long story short, I asked for a, uh, a contract from Enebra if they were still interested. They said, yes, yes, yes. And I don't want to get into all the details, but I'll just say that I, I never received a, a written uh, formal uh, offer. So I wrote, I, I actually uh, went to the PSA, our Philippine Sports Writers Association Awards, because I was in an right. award. And that was cornered by Sina Bessales and all the PSA writers. And they said, we've been hearing a lot of things. And we just want to know if we'll be interviewing you next year for the PBA. And that's when I, I came on. I said, well, I have no official written offer from Hanabra San Miguel. I am jobless. So ABS-CBN caught, caught on that. And the next day, they called me. They obviously read the newspaper. So they called me. And they said, come on over. And they said, um, well... Uh, we'd like you to play in the NBA. I said, are you, you know, are you serious? And they said, very. I said, okay, so let's talk. So that's, that's how it all started. And I really had no intentions, but when they, they said, okay, let's do it. And I said, are you willing to put that in writing? They gave me an offer right away, like within mm -hmm. 30 minutes. So, but to be honest, I took the offer and I went back to the PBA. I went to commissioner June Bernardino and I said, here, this is, I have an offer. This is in writing. Can somebody do something on this side of the fence? Because I haven't received anything from anything in about a year. And he tried. And I did, I did meet with other teams. Like I met with Santa Lucia. I met with um, uh, Exi Robles and uh, Buddy. But, you know, it just didn't work out. So I guess I'm playing for the NBA. That's how, I, that's how my uh, road uh, changed pretty dramatically. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there was a news that came out that you were the highest paid player in the NBA. How true was this? Uh, definitely. Uh, it was, it was uh, you know, it was public. Um, it, was, it was actually bigger than a lot of people think, too. Um, it's funny. Mm -hmm. because, uh, well, I don't want to get into all the details of that as well. Of course, but of course. Of course. They don't want to. Uh -huh. it, it, when, I, when I first agreed and we did a handshake, it was... Uh -huh years uh but on the day of the signing it was changed to three years mm -hmm. so it would have been even bigger so even though it was yes very very big it would have been bigger so i was telling myself you know what do i have to lose why not right let's try it it's just a new league uh it's growing um i i thought at the time it had a chance uh, but you know it's, that league just didn't work out as well i mean uh, they also had some stumbling blocks and some, mm -hmm. some i guess you can say some uh startup jitters i guess you could say but um you know i i still believe and i i've always believed in in um uh the format of the league i really liked it i mean i liked having um you represent a place 
as opposed to just representing a product. You know, I think it has um, uh, possibilities, potential. Uh, it still does, and it and it's doing well right now with uh, Manny Pacquiao's league, right? This right, uh, MPBL, right? So you can see it has definitely. Uh, they, they've learned, I guess you could say, maybe from their MBA mistakes and they're applying whatever they've learned as a mistake and fixing it uh, with this MPPL. So I think they're doing very well. <laughs> okay. And you're, used to, you're used to the love and adulation of Ginebra fans, but while playing for Ilo Ilo, what were the things you loved the most well, as well as the MBA fans in general? Um, well, you know, to be honest, I, I really liked Ilo Ilo. I enjoyed it. Um, uh, the the bachoy and all of the... La Paz. La Paz bachoy. Yes, yes, I was right. doing probably uh -huh. too much. Well, and, you know, to be honest, we had a very good team. Um, mm -hmm. I think we could have, maybe should have won the championship. But that was also a year I, I for some weird reason, I got some weird injuries. Like uh, mm -hmm. in 99 when I signed, uh, I had a foot that needed to be operated on, uh, and I recovered from that. I came back, and I was playing already, and then I had a really, really bad um, fall. Uh, mm -hmm. and I totally dislocated and everything, my shoulder, and it was basically career-threatening. So some really crazy things happened, and um, I was just fortunate that I went to the right doctors, and I got the right treatment, and I was... Uh, healed so I could come back to play because a lot of people thought maybe I won't play again but mm -hmm. um, because I, I really you know I'm the type that does whatever I have to do to get in best shape possible I, I was determined to come back so I did come back and ended up playing for you know, five more years so not bad <laughs> <laughs> uh, can, can you still recall that chaotic uh, incident when you represented uh, the uh, the, the the country, the, the Jones Cup, uh, you have the NBA selection out there, right? Yeah, I, that that still rigs uh, very well. Um, well, okay, first of all, you got to look back in history. 98, the, the Philippine team, the Centennial team. Right. Uh, which I was supposed to be a part of, by the way. I was the last person cut by Coach Tim Cohn. But anyways, <laughs> okay. very short, um, they won the championship. Right. And obviously, the game's in Taiwan, in Taipei. And the Filipinos, you know, Filipinos love their basketball. So mm -hmm. it was probably, they said around 80 to 90% of the crowd in the gymnasium were, were, were the noise. Mm -hmm. So what uh, the funny Taiwanese organizers did is they hoarded the tickets and they wouldn't sell to Filipinos for mm -hmm. our, the next year. So it was a big setup. Okay, uh -huh. that's the first part. The second was um, there was a lot of bad media, I guess you could say, when we... Um, even before we got there, because I don't know if you remember, but that was the time they, they here in the Philippines, they wouldn't let, like, for example, uh, I think it was Eva Air, they wouldn't let them land here because they were landing the planes that were too heavy or something. So they, there was a, I guess you could say there was, there's a political side to it too, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they weren't happy about that. So the fact that we were the f past champions, uh, we were going there and, th you know, when we get, to Taipei, every day we read the newspaper, if you're there for a few days before, there's always like, you know, uh, uh, something negative against Philippines. I mean, or <laughs> some worker there got caught or whatever, or accused of stealing or something. Like that. You know, it's just, there was nothing positive at all. So when the, the, the game started, um, we knew that they were good and we had no doubts because they were already, they were really, you know, a, a very good team and they were beating us well i mean like 15 20 points i think in the first quarter and then some things changed uh second quarter that really make you wonder because for example they they took out their best players and the referees just turned a blind eye to so many things mm -hmm. you know as players i have always said this when you're a player you have to adjust to the referees it's not the other way around the referee's letting you play, you play. If he's calling it tight, you be careful. It's like that. They were letting us play. And you know, as Filipinos, they were letting us play. Let's go. So we're just banging away. And, um, you know, there was just some obvious calls that they uh, missed. For example, there was a time this player got mad. He turned around and he threw the ball at Ronald McDudas. Mm -hmm. 
isn't that an obvious technical? It happened three four line uh, from the three point line, and referee just looked. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> turned the blind eye. Yeah, okay. yeah pretty, pretty bad. So I, I just, you know, it was that was when the fight happened. Uh, it was kind of anticlimactic because I kind of knew it was coming. I just <laughs> didn't like the cheap shot they did to my good friend Joey Mente. Because Joey Mente's head was, you know, turned, and the guy hit him in the back of the head. Right. Mm -hmm. so I will say that's the, enough for that story. But <laughs> that's about it. the worst you experienced, probably. Yeah, and, you know, and you know what's really crazy is, mm -hmm. okay, that night we got taken back to our hotel, police escort, mm -hmm. all of that. Um, the operator in our hotel. Uh, he's you know, he calls my room. Oh, Vince, yes, uh, we're sending up security to your your floor. I'm like, why? Mm -hmm. He goes, uh, you and five other guys just had death threats phoned into us. Mm -hmm. like, wow, this is serious. So, anyways, long story short, uh, it wasn't a fun situation. I, mm -hmm. I don't look back too fondly on that experience. Um, and what I really, and I'm just gonna say it, what I didn't like is when we got back from Taipei. The media blamed us. <laughs> huh? We were the ones who were trying to play basketball for the Philippines. We were just taking advantage of, and they started the fight, and then they're going to blame us. Anyways. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, of course, your stint in the NBA proved to be short lived as the league also folded up shortly. But you were recruited by Red Bull. Was there any other PBA team which tried tried to recruit you or coming from the NBA? Uh, I really, you know, it was for me. It was uh, at that point. I I talked to other teams. I had my agent at the time in um, in, in Boss Danny Spiritu, mm -hmm. and Red Bull seemed to be the best fit uh, mm -hmm. for me at that time. Um, you know, it was different, definitely. Um, but you know, there was a team that I think was on the rise and starting mm -hmm. to win championships, and we had a amazing team if you look back at the talent we had maybe right. we should have never lost the game <laughs> but that's uh that was a good experience as well i mean red bull i mean i look back even though uh i didn't get as much playing time or whatever that that team i still look at it you know it was it was a good time They're good friends i still have uh you know very good conversations with all my teammates there mm -hmm. so you joined a red bull team that is also rising stars and coached by yang yao and like coach jawa we know coach yang also has a fiery personality but other than that what were the similarities you saw in these two great coaches um you know let's put it this way i think every coach deals with pressure you know mm -hmm. some deal with it in one way some deal with another i think uh you know every coach does that i don't care who it is it could be phil jackson it could be you know, the best coach is Mike Krzyzewski. Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, coach Jaworski is, uh, I'll say, a very much a, a positive reinforcer. And I'll say Coach Yang is pretty much a negative reinforcer. That's just the way he does it. <laughs> he, he has his way of getting you pushed and pressuring you, which at first I had a hard time, to be honest, to adjust. But I think I did adjust after a while because you just have to, that's his way. And he he's not afraid. He's very similar to Coach um, Chot in that respect. Uh, he's not afraid to talk to a player and tell him straight, this is what you need to do. Uh, this is where you have to improve. This is where, you know, maybe you aren't very good. He'll tell you straight. He's not afraid to say those things, which I, I do respect. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm playing for Red Bull in 2001. You were going up against San Miguel Beer in the finals, no? And we know that the beer men were the yardstick among competing squads back then. But when, when, but when your young Red Bull team defeated San Miguel, did you realize how special this group of guys were and cemented the status of Coach Yang as one of the best tacticians ever? Um, I'll, I'll just say the players we had were unbelievable. I mean, just uh -huh. look at the players. Think about it. You have a 6'10", Mick Penisi, 6'9", mm -hmm. Ron Hart. I mean, you got... Noli Laksin, who's like fourth, third string with Nelson Asaitono. I mean, you look at the, the roster, it's unbelievable. And then our guards, you have Junti, you have Lordi, you have Jimwell, you have Willie. Don't forget Willie. Yeah. <laughs> unbelievable. 
I mean, it was it was really difficult to even get time on the court. Um, so I mean, again, again, you look at the 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 firepower we had. It was amazing. I, I'm not sure we should have lost the game. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and true enough, you were able to repeat as champions the following season. But at that, ha have you contemplated of retiring from the PBA? Because I understand you had numerous injuries. Um, no, not really. Uh, that wasn't even part of my thoughts. In fact, uh, after I finished my stint in Red Bull, I ended up being the first Filipino to play professionally in the U.S. And right, the, right. I really wanted to play. Um, I wasn't sure if Red Bull was the right place for me at that time, but I wanted to keep going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, there's a message from Coach Yang. Uh, we recruited Vince from the NBA because the league pulled it up, and we know Vince was at the latter stretch of his career, but we believe that he still has some good years left in him. His three-point shooting is so important for us, and his excellent fan appeal and marketability was also a big boost for our franchise. Vince played pretty well in our two championship runs. Send my regards to him. That's from Coach Ye. Thanks, Coach. <laughs> okay. Uh, before Keeper Ravenna, Ray Parks, Toby Ravenna, and Kai Soto, among others, uh, there was Vince Season who played in the United States. And you saw action for the Pennsylvania Valley Dogs coached by NBA legend Chocolate Thunder Daryl Dawkins. How can you tell us your experience there? Wow. I, I, I'll tell you this. I, I think I was in the best shape I've ever been in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you got to remember, you know, the USBL is, is basically the D League now or the G League now. And all of those guys are not just good, very good. Like our imports here most of them played there right mm -hmm. and not just one they're technically they're all very very good yeah so, i i still remember J jermaine walker i don't know if he's still your uh, he was your uh teammate then yeah so i mean you had so many good players um extremely talented extremely long and tall and all of that so you know they, they were just really good and mm -hmm. um uh i'll never forget my first practice um the it was in allentown and um let's just say if you weren't in shape you were gonna die <laughs> because the way he ran our practices was the way he would he wanted the team to run in the games so like the the conditioning was very very difficult the way that they did it so we would practice um and it, not you know i'm not to say that PBA practices are easy, mm -hmm. but this is just Ibang level difficult because the, the, the season is so short. It's only two, three months, talaga, and then you're done. Um, but they have a two month buildup, and I was there for the full two month buildup. Man, I'm telling you, I went home every night and I just I, I crashed. I fell asleep <laughs> and I was so tired. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we worked not just in the basketball court. They do so many, they do weights, they do swimming, they do extra shooting, they open up the gym. If you want to shoot from like 9 p.m. to midnight, you, you can do that if you want. So Ibang level, the way that they did it. And, you know, Coach Daryl was, you know, for me, a, an amazing coach. Uh, I think he, he taught me so much um, and he was really nice. I mean, mm -hmm. he's a huge guy. If you look at him, yeah. six foot ten, maybe like, you know, as big as Asi, like like that before, but even yeah. bigger, right? Yeah, yeah, and there was a time he defended Karim Abdul Jabbar in the championship series. That's how big he was. <laughs> and, and, and just very explosive, but he had the respect of all the players. And I think I gained some respect from him as well because, you know, I wasn't afraid. You know, there were some guys that were trying to like bully me or whatever, try to be rugged with me. And I wasn't having that. And uh, I almost came to, you know, a couple of fisticuffs in some of those practices as well. So for me, um, you know, especially, uh, you know, having that experience being the first, you know, I, I just pray that, you know, it helps to open more do doors to Filipinos to, to try something new. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I'm, I'm so happy guys like Kai Soda are out there. Maybe he has a chance of getting an NBA. That, that's so awesome. Why don't we have more? I think we should have more. We have so many Filipinos who 
who I think can excel on even that level. But again, they have to have the proper support. Uh, and uh, get pushed in the right direction. That, yeah, we'll, we'll just you know fate, leave it up to fate as far as how that goes. But uh, you know we're just here to support them, and I hope that my stint, um, as well as Bong Alvarez, who, who also came, right. uh, you know, was uh, something that people will remember one day and say, "Hey, they opened the door." <laughs> okay. Well, well, like other players, coaching coaching after playing was the logical destination. Of some players, and you were not an exception, as you were you well as well uh, joined the coaching fray. What were the teams you've been involved with in coaching aside from Blackwater? Um, I I won't even call myself a coach because when I um like I went with Adamson for a bit, uh, I actually feel like more. I'm most happy to be honest with you when I'm dealing with kids. Okay, uh, I think kids are the most moldable, and they listen and they want to get better and you know, it's easier. I think as guys get older, they think they already know everything and it's difficult to actually get through to them. So I like to work with kids. So I first started with, I was offered by um, Coach Kenneth, actually, Duremdes, uh, mm -hmm. to be part of his staff uh, and Adamson. But I told him I, 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 I was busy. I had a few businesses at the time and I didn't want to take away from that. So I asked him if I could just do like a part-time thing. He mm -hmm. says, yeah, sure. So we did. And I, I basically was like the skills coach. All I did was work on, you know, moves and shooting and, you know, the fundamentals and stuff like that. And I had some really good players. We had Jensen Rios and, mm -hmm. and uh, Giuliano. Don was quite an athlete, but his confidence needed to be built. So those are the types of success stories that I think we had. And we had some good, uh, good bunch of guys. Uh, you know, I won't say we we're the most uh, physically talented team. and We didn't have the tallest, most rugged, whatever type of people, but, you know, we, we worked with what we had, uh, but I, I don't look at that as a negative. Um, I also was asked um, by the uh, Everbelena group to join as a uh, consultant uh, for uh, Blackwater. I wasn't also a coach. See, I'm, I'm still not a coach. I've never been a coach. Because um, I, I always think it, it's not that I, I don't think that I will coach. Maybe one day I will, but I, I, I'm not closing the door on that. But I, I think the situation has to be right. Um, mm -hmm type of person that wants to build from the ground up um i want to have certain things in place and uh, you know that's just the way it is i mean and um i'd have to have the right situation but if i had that right situation i'm more than confident i would do well <laughs> <laughs> okay okay so we, we have a segment here called the list it's a short list a little bit of everything i'd like to ask you the things you remember the most from the pointers given either by the Big J or Yang Yao, it's something you cannot forget. Okay, sorry, did I just lose you? Come again. Can you can you hear us, Vince? Okay, I think I lost you. Uh, you, you lost me. Sorry. Yeah, we, we can still hear you, Vince. Oh, you can hear me. Can you see me? Uh, yeah. Okay. okay, sorry about that. I thought I lost you guys. Um, okay. Weird. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the okay, things so you remember the most from the pointers given either by the Big J or Yang Yao, something you cannot forget. Uh, you know, Coach Jaworski for me was, was the kind of guy that always said, you know, you can do it. You can have that, that, you know, there's nobody different like in this game or in this league or in this, in this, you know, in the Philippines uh, or elsewhere that is different. It's the sense that we all have two arms, two legs. We all put our pants on one leg at a time. You know, we all, you know, there's no secret to getting better and it's just working hard, getting better, um, working on your craft, building your confidence, um, making it very important. And if you can do that, then, you know, uh, the sky's the limit. And, you know, I, I look at, you know, really Coach Jaworski as the guy who really helped me to get there. And, uh, you know, I definitely wouldn't have had much of a career if it wasn't for him. Um, you know, even in Pure Foods, I wasn't getting all the playing time that I wanted. And it, it was okay. It was just the way it was. I was the, I was the new guy. But, you know, when I had the chance with Inebra, I, I, I like to think that 
I, I did my best and I, I worked hard and I tried my best to, to make it, make it, uh, you know, to flourish. Um, uh, it wasn't easy. I'll tell you that right now, because, you know, we weren't, uh, you know, contrary to most people's thoughts, you know, yes, you're in the PBA, but we're not a gazillionaire. <laughs> you're not like you're going to retire and go buy a yacht and, and all those things just off of one year in the PBA or two. I mean, it takes time. So, um, you know, I really worked hard. I, I just said to myself, I want to be the best possible version of me I can be. And if I can do that, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you're going to play five on five with your former teammates. And even the chance to select your five with you playing at the number two, number two spot, who would you, would you select to play with you? Ah, uh, you, you got me. <laughs> Well, definitely uh, Marlo and Oli. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Val. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it's tough. It's tough. There's so many good players. Willie, I, I got to tell you this. Um, I knew Willie Miller was going to be an amazing player the first mm -hmm. time I guarded him because I was like looking at him I'm like, you know, there's still the NBA. And, mm -hmm. and I was like, who's this guy? He's, he's not that tall. He's only like 5'11", 6 feet. Mm -hmm. But he was like going up to the rim and finishing at the rim and he was shooting and he's left-handed, which is always an advantage. So <laughs> I knew he was going to be something special. And he was, I mean, how many uh -huh. get to buy even in the PBA? So, um, you know, he would probably be a guy I'd put on my starting five. Why not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course. Uh -huh. Okay. On top of your head, the two most memorable moments that happened to your professional basketball career. Uh, okay. First of all, the block, cause that was for me, the, uh, it's kind of a funny story behind that because, um, the ball actually went to me first, uh, mm -hmm. out of bounds and they hit the ball out of my hands and they stole the ball. And I thought, well, if I don't get this ball, I am so dead. Coach is going to never let me hear the end of this. So that's when I made that, um, leap of faith. And I got that block of, of uh, Dean Dukumar, but um <laughs> if i didn't get that ball it would be a much diff different story um wow so many i don't know i mean there was a, there was a, a steal i got against uh june Limput that tied up the game to send it to overtime i mean there's a bunch of other stuff um mm -hmm. i don't know it's tough mm -hmm. I, I like i like shooting you know that's just me um i think if you look at me as a player i, I think a lot of people will have to realize what I was before I was a, while I was a basketball player. Um, mm -hmm. Most people don't realize I used to run distance. I used to do cross country. Um, mm -hmm. I did far runs. Like I would do like 12 mile, 15 mile runs every day for like five, six days a week. So I was generally doing like 60, 75 um, miles a week for, for months on end. So I kind of knew what um, I say pain was. And when I, um, uh, had this, uh, you know, really serious interest in basketball, I realized that um, come the fourth quarter, um, most guys are getting tired, mm. but I'm actually getting stronger, right? Okay. That goes back to my time in the, in, the, in the cross country. So if you look at my career, and I'll, I'll, I'll be the first one to always say that, I never jumped the highest. There were guys like Verhel and Samboy and those guys who were jumping crazy. Uh, I, I never ran the fast. You got Bal, you got a zillion guys that are probably faster than me. Um, I don't think I ever shot the best. I think, I mean, Alan Kaidik was an amazing, great shooter. I mean, I was always kind of chasing him, right? So, but what I did have is I had that fourth quarter longevity. And I think that's when I got the best. And I think that's when... People are getting tired and they're kind of starting to rest a little bit on defense. I think that's when I made them pay the most. So there's my secret. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Vince, it's a pleasure for you to have us here. And uh, um, would you like to thank uh, your fans or anybody you would like to thank? Oh, wow. So there's... Thank you, everybody. My goodness. Uh, all around the world. I, I know this is going around the world. So congratulations. Uh, on this wonderful new show of yours. I, I, I'm honored to be a part of it. And, uh, you know, I just want to encourage everybody right now because I know times are difficult uh, mm -hmm. and strange and just not 
normal right now with this whole COVID. Uh, just want to encourage everybody to please do stay safe, uh, do do that social distancing, do all of those things that uh, are very necessary. There's so many um, good people having a hard time, and um, I, there's one I, there's one I want everybody to say a quick prayer for is um, uh, our longtime uh, uh, masahista uh, mm -hmm. June. June, right. Oh. A few days ago, um, that guy was amazing. Uh, I would have never been anything without him. I say that a hundred times because, I mean, when I dislocated my finger, he's the one who popped it back in. Or mm -hmm. when uh, I needed a really bad uh, injury massage, he's the one who miraculously fixed it. So, you know, he did that to not just our team, but to, to every team. He's been with Jaworski since like the 80s. So, um, pretty, pretty sad loss, and you know we're gonna pray for him and his family. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'd like to greet uh, some people out here. Uh, belated happy birthday to uh, the lovely Miss Lorelai Montserrat, and hello as well to Miss Noemi de la Cruz. He is a certified Vince season fan. Vince <laughs> Noemi de la Cruz, uh, and uh, CJ Camia. Happy birthday as well to Miss Madeline Obando, my co-founder. And birthday greetings as well.